Nehemiah prays for his people. Nehemiah is sent to Judah with a vision. Before he shares the vision, he views the destruction for three days, and then he rallies the remnant to rise and work. And Paul corrects the conduct in the church. Today on 3 in 1, as we consider Nehemiah chapters 1 through 3 and 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Well, I apologize in advance. Uh, Today's podcast may be a little bit longer than we're used to. Ezra and Nehemiah are some of my favorite books in the Bible. Last episode, we were in the book of Ezra, where we saw a remnant of the people of Israel returning from captivity in Babylon to rebuild the temple and to restore the sacrificial worship of God in Jerusalem. Now, their God-given opportunity was not without opposition. For whenever the people of God say, let us arise and build, The enemies of God say, let us arise and attack. And these attacks were intense enough to initially discourage the people into sitting down for a very long time. But like we read, thankfully, men like Haggai and Zechariah came along, used by the Lord to stir up the people with the Spirit of God and the Word of God, giving them the courage to get up and to stand in faith and to continue the work. Well, now the book of Nehemiah begins about 15 years after the book of Ezra ends. And as we read, God once again encouraged his discouraged people. And his main message, blinking like a neon sign, was never stop building. Never stop building, no matter what. We read this in verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah, it came to pass in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, One of my brethren came with the men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. So now, even though it's only 15 years after Ezra ends, it's about 100 years after the first remnant returned to Jerusalem. And one of Nehemiah's relatives returns from Jerusalem. And Nehemiah asks, how's the remnant doing? And how's Jerusalem doing? And in verse 3, we read, And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So this obviously hit Nehemiah really hard. And then Nehemiah wisely passes on the passion to the Lord in prayer. In verse 5, we read, I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. Now it's in verse 11 where the rubber meets the road. In verse 11, we read, O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. Wait, what did he just say? He just said, Lord, if you want to use me, I'm available. Please, Lord, grant me mercy in the sight of this man, for I am the king's cupbearer. The king's cupbearer, he he was responsible for tasting any wine that the king wanted to drink to make sure that it wasn't poison. And although it was dangerous duty, it did allow Nehemiah a unique proximity to the king. But he was just a cupbearer. And he knew that if he had any hope in helping his people, it would take a miraculous intervention of an almighty God to bring it to pass. And so he prays, let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Then there's chapter two. In chapter two, verse one, it said, and it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore, the king said to me, why is your face sad since you're not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid. Now, why do you think he became dreadfully afraid? 
Well, one of the reasons is probably because you could lose your life for being sad in the king's presence. It was an offense. It was a capital crime in the king's court. Now, I find this whole interaction intriguing. Verse 1 told us that the interaction took place four months after Nehemiah prayed his prayer from chapter 1. And for four months, he's been waiting for an opportunity, asking God to give him favor in the sight of the king. And for four months, he has done this with with a happy face, trusting God. But for some reason on this day, his face is sad. And verse 1 told us that he had never been sad in the king's presence. And so the king says to him, why is your face sad since you're not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. And so I became dreadfully afraid. And so I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? (laughs) Good for you, Nehemiah. I mean, good is dead. Nehemiah goes for broke. And he shares his heart with the king. And I can almost see him cringe and close his eyes when he completes his sentence, waiting for his his head to be lost. (laughs) But God heard his prayer and gave him favor with the king. And God answered his prayer for favor with the king. And then the king said to him, well, what do you request? And so I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, man, I love that. Verse four and verse five together of chapter two, I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king. So often we think that all of our prayers have to be like the four months of longing in sackcloth and ashes. But at verse four and verse five together gives us an example of an immediate prayer, fast as breath. The king said to him, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. And again, Nehemiah goes for broke and he holds his breath, waiting for the king's answer. And it says, the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will your journey be? And when when will you return? And so it pleased the king to send me. And I set a time. It's fantastic. Now, here's a little difference between Nehemiah and Ezra. Remember when Ezra asked for a few things and then he stopped short of asking for all the things that he needed? Nehemiah was going a little bit further. He was emboldened by the awareness of God's hand upon his life and he asks for even more. In verse seven, we read, furthermore, I said to the king, (laughs) if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river that, that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple for the city wall and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of God upon me, the good hand of my God upon me. It's fantastic. And all of this started with a simple burden brought to the Lord in prayer. Nehemiah saying, God, the situation, these people, it's gripping my heart and I don't know what to do, but I know that you do. And I want you to know, Lord, that that I'm available. And then he waits. He waits for that miraculous moment where the almighty God intervenes in the affairs of men. And when that moment finally comes, Nehemiah is ready and he's willing. And he prays to the God of heaven and he answers the king. And he goes for broke and God gives him favor with the king. That's fantastic. Now, before we go on, we have to mention that this exact day is the decree that the prophet Daniel foresaw in Daniel chapter 9. We've talked about that a number of times. And from this point of reference, this specific fixed point of reference given to us here in the book of Nehemiah, 173,880 days later, Jesus would finally allow the crowds to publicly hail him as the Messiah in direct fulfillment to Daniel's amazing prophecy. So trust God. He is so much bigger than any hindrances that we could throw his way. Now, continuing with Nehemiah, he makes it to Jerusalem. He waits three days before sharing his heart with the elders. He spent that time letting the vision simmer in his heart, going out at night, running his hands over the rubble. 
And then when the burden starts to boil over in his heart, he gathers the officials and he shares his heart with them. In verse 17, we read, Then I said to them, You see the distress that we're in, and how Jerusalem lies waste, and its gates are burned with fire. Come, and let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, Let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. Man, you could not ask for a better reaction from the people after an exhortation. Nehemiah says, guys, you walk by this rubble every day. You see the distress. Come on, let us build the wall together. God's hand is in this. He's answered my prayer. He's given me favor with the king. And so they said, let us rise up and build. And they set their hands to this good work. It is. It's fantastic. But whenever the people of God say, let us arise and build, the enemies of God say, let us arise and attack. In verse 19, we read, But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they laughed at us, and they despised us, and they said, What is this thing that you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? Man, this is so hard to bear. Mockery is one of the devil's most discouraging tactics, and one of his most effective tactics. Because if you give into it, you sit down, and you don't do anything. But if you, if you fight back by defending yourself, you, you f usually fight back in the flesh. And so there's really only one way to properly handle mockery. And it's the way that Nehemiah handled it. In verse 20, it says, So I answered them and I said, The God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build. But you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. I love that. Nehemiah stands in faith and he sets his face like flint to the God-given task before him and his faith is contagious. The people say, let us arise and build. And with Nehemiah, they set their hands to this good work. Now, in chapter three, we saw how they were laid out, how the, how the people were laid out around the wall, who worked where on the wall. And there was two phrases that dominated the chapter. One was next to them, and the other was made repairs. The Hebrew word translated made repairs literally means to strengthen. And so it's such a great illustration of the body of Christ. Each has a part next to the other in strengthening the whole. Ephesians 4.16 says, Christ makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. All right, now on to our New Testament reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where the Apostle Paul continues his correction of the Corinthians' conduct, addressing such things as coverings and communion. Coverings as a symbol of submission, and communion as a symbol of Christ's sacrifice. Both were being abused and taken for granted in the city of Corinth, and in Corinth, apparently, culturally, women having long hair and having a head covering were important, especially since prostitution was so prevalent in this city. Uh, I was fortunate enough to go on a Greece extension from an Israel study tour, and I was there in the city of Corinth. And at one point, our guide pointed to the top of a tall hill and told us that every single night at sundown, the temple prostitutes would walk through the streets, inviting men and women to worship with them the way that they would worship in that culture. And one of the ways that they were identified as temple prostitutes was to have their hair shaved off. So you can see why culturally in this city, it was really important for women to have long hair and to have a head covering. And some in the church were saying, well, I'm free in Christ. I can do anything I want in Christ. I can, I can shave my head if I want to, and I can dress any way that I want. And then Paul's responding to that attitude and saying, well, not if you want to be effective in evangelism and not if you want to be honoring to your husband. But Paul said, look, if anyone wants to pick a fight about all this, we don't have this custom anywhere else. 
So just make your own choices. And I would say the same to you, since many Christian circles have taken this passage and made it into their own cultural dress code. And so I say, listen, just honor God and honor your conscience and honor your husband. Okay, on to communion. This was the most disheartening correction to the Corinthians to me. See, in Corinth, they had potlucks just like we do. They had fellowship feasts just like we do, whatever you want to call them. They were common in Corinth, and they always included communion. But since they were common, people started to take them for granted and treat even communion as a common thing. And for that, Paul brought correction. See, communion with the Lord and communion with each other, that's what we've been saved for. And God has given us a ceremony to symbolize all of this, and it's called, (laughs) yep, communion. The cracker and the juice, the bread and the wine, significant symbols of Christ's sacrifice. And it's to be taken seriously, consciously remembering and proclaiming what Christ has done in providing us with the opportunity to have true fellowship and communion with God and with each other, refreshing our commitment to that fellowship with God and with each other. And yet the Corinthians were not only just going through the motions and taking this ceremony for granted, they were actually acting selfishly in the midst of this significant ceremony. And Paul brought the stern word of correction that was necessary, the unfortunate responsibility of pastors at times. Ending the chapter with, specific application, and a not-so-subtle warning. We read this at the end of the chapter. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone's hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. Well, that not-so-subtle warning was just from the Apostle Paul, pastor of a church. Yet someday soon may even be today, the Lord of the church is going to come. And he's going to set every wrong right. He's going to set everything in order. And he's going to start with his people in his church. And what's he going to find? What's he going to find in our fellowship? And what's he going to find in my family? And what's he going to find especially in my own heart?